Good morning, class of 2007. All right, all right, they're all enthused. They're ready for you. Okay, good. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. He's my best friend from New York, next to Colonel Visco, of course. But uh, and the reason why he's my best friend is because he loves playing golf, he loves barbecue, and if he wasn't doing this lecture, I'd have to. So, <laughs> but. Uh, Dr. Puccio was here last year, so we're welcoming him back to the stage for the second time. Uh, and he comes with accreditation of uh, over 30 books, chapters, and research into creativity. He's, uh, he's got his master's in creativity from the uh, University of Buffalo State in New York, and he has a doctorate from the University of Manchester in England, and that was in organizational psychology. I think I got that right. Now, I'm, I'm getting good at this, aren't I, Jerry? Next year it'll be easier, okay? But anyway, so I'd like you a warm welcome for Dr. Gerard Puccio, and uh, welcome back to the stage. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back here, and, uh, and good to meet you all. I understand that you're just... Uh, embarking on this uh, educational experience, so it's a, a treat for me to be here early on to, uh, to make an impression and to talk to you about a very important topic, creativity and leadership. Um, it's interesting, uh, yesterday on my flight down uh, from Buffalo to Atlanta, I get on, my, get on the plane and I sit down and I start chatting with the uh, fellow sitting next to me and it turns out that he was in the Navy for nine years. He now works for, uh, Bill likes that, don't you, Bill? I was in the Navy for nine years, and uh, now he works for the FAA. He works on uh, long-distance radar systems. And we were chatting, and I asked him about his experience in the Navy, and he said uh, he really thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, gave him a lot of experience, uh, uh, helped to develop some important skills. And uh, I just got the impression he really enjoyed his experience. And I asked him, well, if you enjoyed it so much, why did you leave? And he looked at me and said, you know why I left? Leadership. And he had no idea I was coming down to talk to you all. <laughs> so I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity to interview somebody. And I proceeded to have about an hour-long conversation with him. And I asked him, well, you say, uh, you say you left because of leadership. What was that all about? And he said, you know what? I just got to the point where, after working with uh, a number of commanders, I just got the impression they weren't interested in my ideas, and that frustrated me. And I sat there, and I was thinking, you know what? Nine years, nine years of training, investment into this human resource, and he left because of leadership. That's one of the consequences of ineffective leadership. And it helped me to realize and to see in the flesh the impact of not being able, as a leader, to support people's ideas and to be open to people's ideas. Wonderful setup for, uh, for today's presentation. I thought I'd share that, that personal story with you, which is a, a great lead into why I'm here, to talk to you about uh, creative thinking and how it applies to leadership. And there are... Um, Arguments being put forward today in the, in the creativity literature and in, in the area of leadership that one of the core competencies, especially today in this fast-changing world where, oh boy, we know about this in the Air Force, where technology has such an impact on our organization, keeping up with the pace of technology requires us to be creative thinkers. So in the hour and a half that I have with you before we go off to the seminars, my goal is to uh, lay out some some fundamental concepts, um, give you some insights into what is this relationship between creativity and leadership, what is creative thinking, and how does that support effective leadership. That's, that's my goal today. Okay. I was told that uh, you all prefer not to be read to, so uh, I'm going to let you glance over the, uh, over the slide that's up here. Being a creative leader means taking risks. It means exposing yourself. It means following ideas that you're passionate about. 
And sometimes that means defying others. And that's what this quote looks at. Um, I have a book on leadership that's coming out in, in just a couple months. And in the process of writing that book, at the same time I was reading uh, a book you may be familiar with called Flyboys. Uh, it came out in 2003. And in there, there's a story about someone that many of you will be certainly more familiar with than, than me, Billy Mitchell. Is that a familiar name? Yeah, figured it was. Well, I wasn't that familiar with Billy Mitchell. And, and in this book on leadership, we wanted to include some cases. And so we wrote up a, a mini case on, on Billy Mitchell. And uh, I think what it does is underscores in your own area, in the Air Force, sometimes the heat that creative leaders face, creative visionaries. So here's the case that we included in this book, and I think it brings to life this, this quote. So aviation recently celebrated its 100th anniversary of controlled power flight. Though the benefits of commercial and military flight are without question today, this has not always been the case. In fact, in the earlier days of military aviation, there were staunch opponents, primarily military leaders of the established branches, such as the Navy and the Army, who believed airplanes contributed no real advantage to warfare. One visionary, Billy Mitchell, the first American to fly over enemy positions during World War I, recognized how the stalemate and tremendous bloodshed associated with trench warfare could be eradicated through air power. At that time, Colonel Mitchell envisioned how airplanes could strike at the strategic nerve center of the enemy and thus, in his estimation, reduce the tremendous loss of human life associated with traditional methods of warfare. Upon returning to the U.S. after World War I with the rank of general, Mitchell began to speak out about the centrality of airplanes to the future of warfare. A visionary, he could see the potential. General Mitchell described with great eloquence how future wars could be defined as much by what happened on land and sea as they could be by what occurred in the air. This visionary leader, as is often the case, was viewed as a heretic. He was perceived as a threat by the military establishment. Where current military leaders can only see two dimensions to war, land and sea, Mitchell was describing a third dimension. He was challenging the established paradigm. And what happens to people when they challenge the paradigm? They often get ostracized. As an officer in the army, his superiors ordered Mitchell to tone down his message. In response, you know what he did? He redoubled his efforts to share his vision. Things came to a head in July 19, 1921 when Mitchell was invited to put his ideas of air power to the test against a captured German battleship believed to be unsinkable. With some 30 military, governmental, and public leaders present, a fleet of Martin bombers, tiny specks in the air, in contrast to the behemoth battleship, took off at 12.19 p.m. Some 20 minutes later, they released their bombs, and at 12.40, the unsinkable battleship disappeared below the surface. Despite the obvious success of this test, most military leaders still claimed to see no merit in the idea of airplanes as main instruments of warfare. In fact, General John Pershing, the only person besides George Washington to hold the rank of General of the Armies, released a report concluding that battleships were still the backbone of the Navy. Despite intense criticism of his ideas, Mitchell persisted. He continued to share his vision of the future with audiences across the U.S. Talk about defying the crowd. In response, the military sent Mitchell on an extended inspection tour of Hawaii, the Philippines, China, India, and Japan. His hiatus from the United States did not dampen his enthusiasm for military aircraft. Conversely, his observations overseas further convinced him that it would be imperative to control the skies in the future, in future wars. In the mid-1920s, Mitchell prophetically predicted the impending war with Japan and hypothesized that the Japanese would use a surprise attack from the air to initiate a war. Mitchell became publicly critical of the traditional military strategists. Eventually, Mitchell was demoted and later was found guilty of insubordination. 
This verdict was reached despite the fact that numerous witnesses provided clear support for Mitchell's views. On February 19, 1936, at the age of 57, Billy Mitchell passed away. Approximately six years later, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor from the air. During the onset of World War II, President Roosevelt was faced with numerous momentous decisions. One of his first decisions changed the nature of military conflict. Remembering the vision of Billy Mitchell, Roosevelt overturned his advisor's suggestions to build up the traditional modes of warfare. Instead, he diverted money to military aircraft. Prior to Roosevelt's request, the United States had produced just 800 planes in a two-year period. Now Roosevelt demanded that 4,000 military planes be turned out per year. The story of Billy Mitchell and the critical response to his ideas illustrate how others with entrenched thinking are often unwittingly incapable of taking an affirmative view of new ideas. And it also underscores when you're a visionary leader, when you're a creative leader, when you're challenging the paradigm, when you're thinking outside the box, the kind of heat, the kind of resistance creative leaders can face. So the birth, the birth of this organization, the Air Force, came from a creative visionary. So it's, it's intriguing to me to be here to talk to you about what it means to be a, a creative leader. It's in the, the DNA of the Air Force. So is there a need for thinking and creative thinking in today's military? Um, I did some searching around the, uh, the internet in, uh, in preparation for today, and I found a few areas just searching create, creative thinking, uh, military, using those as search terms, and I found a couple of areas that came up in uh, strategic distribution. Um, I found some, some reference to the need for innovative thinking. I'll give you some time to, to read over this. And then there were carrying on some examples of how innovative ideas within this logistics area led to some real successes. Here are some of the outcomes. So here we have an example of applying real creative thinking, innovative thinking to strategic distributions, and we can see some positive outcomes. Here are some of the ideas that they pursued. In summary, from this report that I read from Captain Timothy Ross, who described this, you can see he's touting many of the characteristics that we commonly refer to to creative thinking. So he says that, so now that strategic decision work has, has to continue. The personnel involved with strategic distribution will need to use their imagination, flexibility, commitment to, con to continually create business success. Here's a call for continued creative thinking, to drive down costs, to enhance performance. Again, continuing to search around Again, on the internet, looking for creative thinking, I came across another area, another example in terms of attracting recruits to the National Guard and to the reserves because of the deployment now and to the degree to which these um, areas are being stretched. So here's another example for the need for creative thinking. And yesterday, I learned in the briefing session that by the time you all finish in what, May? Is that when you're, you're completed? I understand that there's a goal to reduce the Air Force, what, by 40,000? So 40,000, it's going to be a different force. And that's going to require creative thinking. That's been the mantra in corporate America for many years, doing more with less. That's why innovation and creative thinking in corporate America are hot topics. How do you do more with less? It requires imagination. So what's my focus today? We're going to focus on seeing the need for creative thinking among leaders, 
recognizing that creative problem solving, this ability to think creatively when solving problems, is a core leadership skill, and then understanding how leadership can facilitate or undermine creative thinking in others. So you had some, uh, some readings. In one of the readings that you had in preparation for today, um, it talked about the difference between managers and leaders. I'm not going to go into great depth. I'm going to highlight just a, a, a few key points in this area because managers and leaders are not the same. There are aspects that distinguish managers from leaders. This is one of my favorite quotes around, uh, around this topic. It comes from Bennis and Nanis. This is short, so I will we'll read this to you. Managers are people who do things right. Do things right. What does that mean? It means being efficient. It's, it means uh, being predictable, focusing on control, repeatability. And that's an important skill, there's no doubt. But by contrast, leaders are people who do the right things. People who do the right things. It's the same set of words, doing things right versus doing the right things. Um, I'm going to try to keep you awake, so I'm going to make this interactive as much as possible. Anybody tell me, what, is, what does it mean to do the right thing? Not doing things right, but doing the right things. What does that mean to you? Okay. So doing what's best suited for the organization. Yeah. How about others? What else does that mean to you? You might be under a production deadline and you need to pick out X number of products, but instead whether someone decides to shut it down and you have to do Okay. Okay. So just because um, there's a path you're supposed to pursue, if you take in other information, you can alter course. In other words, yeah, make a decision like that. Yes, sir. Taking care of the, say it again? Taking care of the people. What's that mean? Okay. Okay. So balancing the welfare of the people with, uh, with the output of the product. It's interesting that you mentioned that. The chap I was sitting next to yesterday on the plane, when I asked him, who were the most effective leaders, in your opinion? Who, who did you feel you know, best working for? And he said, you know, I had a, had a skipper one time who... Uh, who put himself out sometimes to support us. And sometimes he took some flack for that. But when he saw that we were being shortchanged or we weren't being supported, he, uh, he would come to bat for us. And uh, he said one time he got, uh, what was the expression he used? Uh, you might be familiar with this, S-canned? Is that, is that kind of code? Or he got S-canned because he, he stuck his neck out but uh, to, to support your point, because that was the right thing to do, to, uh, to push for his people. Yeah, yeah. I thought somebody else had their hand up. Somebody else, anyone else want? Yes, ma'am. Doing the right thing when it's not easy. Uh, doing the right thing when it's not easy, yeah, which is that, that, uh, that visionary leader who pushes forward. Yeah, and we'll take one more because there's someone else who, yeah. Taking the right decision. Yeah, yeah. So... In order to do the right things, that requires creative thinking. Because it's not simply taking things as they are, as given to you, but it's thinking through the problem and finding the best way forward, which is what you're saying, taking the right decision. This comes from John Cotter, a business professor at Harvard. He says management is basically a process where we're focusing on consistent results, and that's important. We need to do that. All organizations need to do that. Leadership, by contrast, is a process whose function is change, to bring about, to respond to, to deal with change. And I can tell you, if uh, the Air Force was reduced by 40,000 members, there's going to be some serious change that you'll have to contend with. So how do we do that? How do we manage that change? It's by challenging the way we have done things, to ask ourselves, are there better ways? Are there different ways of carrying out our tasks? And this is a long quote. I'll let you read over that. But the most critical part is in the, uh, the underlined text.
So Fullen essentially says he's not happy with this distinction that's made between management and leadership. But he says there is one important distinction that does make sense. Leadership is needed for problems that do not have easy answers. That's why you're here. That's why you're in leadership positions. That's what leaders do. Leaders solve the complex problems. Leaders need to think through those problems that don't have easy answers, that don't have answers that are in the manual, where you have to search for the answer, where you have to use your imagination to come up with the answer. That's what leaders do, and that's what distinguishes. That's the key difference between leaders and managers.